I can't wait for July 26th. Summertime is right around the corner. There's a lot of things that are going on, but does anybody know what is happening on July 26th? I think I hear some... Debbie? No, it's not my birthday. That's a good guess. You'll see a picture come up, and the reason I'm so excited is because that's the beginning of the Summer Olympics. The Olympics are a big deal to me. I love them. Okay, I remember as a young kid watching both the Winter and Summer Olympics. It was something that it was uh, just a great time. Even working at the ranch where there is no time in the summer, we would find time to sneak off and watch some of the Olympic games. Some of my fondest memories when I was a kid were from the Olympics. You're going to see some pictures coming up. I obviously like it and love it so much because it combines so many things that I love in life, which is competition, the drive to excel, to overcome the odds, to defy the odds. It is the entire world that is coming together to compete, not just our professional leagues in the United States. It's only done once every four years. It, you know, it doesn't matter what country the person is from. If they win the gold medal, so often when they're on that stand, there's tears coming down their face when the national anthem's playing. There's a sense of national pride. And as you see some of these pictures, maybe some of you identify with some of them. In the upper left-hand corner, when I was six years old, actually, no, I was five years old, uh, Carl Lewis won four gold medals in the 84 Olympics. And he became one of my sports heroes. I loved Carl Lewis. Fastest Man Alive was a super cool title. And then in 88, he was primed to repeat. And this is an image that will be burned in my memory forever of Ben Johnson crossing the finish line with his hand raised. And it was obvious that he was different than everyone else. He was big. And everyone had questions. And two days later, I was introduced to what sports scandal is when it came out that he was doping up for quite a while. And they stripped him of his gold medal, and I didn't understand what was going on. But that was one of those early memories that is huge for me. There's a bunch of other ones up there. Maybe you recognize Florence Griffith Joyner, one of the greatest female athletes in track. The Dream Team, obviously, the original Dream Team. There's so many things that took place in the Olympics. Carrie Shrug, anybody remember that? When she famously vaulted on basically one leg to help win the team title that we weren't supposed to win. And if you think about it, one of the things with Olympians is they are held in high honor. They are held in so much of high honor in a lot of places in the world that they are celebrated more than other athletes because what they put into it is crucial. It is a huge thing. Still one of the greatest accomplishments in sports, and I'll, I'll get off this picture real quick. But the guy in the middle at the top of the screen, a lot of you probably don't even know who he is. I would argue he has the greatest single accomplishment in all of sports. He went 10 plus years with never losing an international race. Terry's shaking his head. He knows who he is. Edwin Moses was a 400 meter hurdler and 10 plus years never lost a single race. Would have been a three time Olympic champion, but we boycotted the 80 Olympics. Super impressive. And he had long streaks on either end of that 10 year when he had those, those one losses. But probably the most dominant single athlete ever to live. And almost no one knows his name. Anyways, when you look at ancient Greek Olympics, things were very different, right? It was still held in very high honor, but there was a different prestige that was around it. There was uh, one of the reasons I put verse 25 in the scripture reading was they were also naked and unashamed. That's how they competed, okay? Uh, it, which is inexplicable to me, but at that time they felt like that was the best way to see with zero advantage, okay? It was just six or eight, depending on what you look at historically, six or eight competitions opposed to the 40 plus. I would love to look back and if we could... Uh, bring one of the ancient Olympians to modern day. I would love for them to watch the Olympics now and see what their thoughts are, especially this year's brand new event. Does anybody know what breaking is? 
That is right. <laughs> Bob, yes. That is right. This year, they're going to award the same gold medal to the best break dancer in the world that they are going to award to the fastest woman or fastest man <laughs> or the, the one that wins the boxing tournament at the different weights or the wrestling, <laughs> okay? I'd love to see one of those ancient Olympians think through why is this person getting the same award. This must have lost honor over time. This must not be the same thing. They would also look and not understand why there wasn't deep philosophical conversations between the athletes. That was not an actual event that they judged, but it was part of their built-in competition every day where they would sit and have deep philosophical discussions. So as we look at marriage today, hopefully you can get a little bit of the connection of why I started with talking about Olympians, and maybe not. And if not, let me connect it for you. It is something that over time has been held in high honor. And change is not always bad. But sometimes things can become diluted. And sometimes things can become in a manner that we don't even realize and we're making them less than what we're told they should be. When we look at marriage, can anyone agree that maybe it's not held in the high honor God wants us to in our culture, in our church? Today, as we look at what we need to stand firm in, I want to remind us of the theme verse, 2 Thessalonians 2.15. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. This call to us is to stand firm in the truth of what Scripture says. We have those letters in word of mouth in print, and we must hold firm. And so looking at Scripture is where the call to stand firm comes directly from today. If you looked at the title of the sermon, hopefully maybe it popped your mind right to the verse that it comes directly from in Hebrews 13, 4, that says, let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. We'll come back to this passage multiple times throughout this message. And as we come back to it, we'll unpack different parts of it. But right now, I want to remind us and call us to stand firm in the fact that we must let marriage be held in high honor among all. We must be different. Before I dive in a little bit more, I also want to point out, is marriage a one-week topic? <laughs> no. Is marriage a four-week sermon series topic? Probably not. Okay, there is so much that scripture says about marriage that we will not have time to get to. But through prayer and counsel from the pastors and staff here at the church, I feel like God is calling us to look at how we hold marriage in high honor among all. We're going to look at three different stages of this. We'll get to that in a minute. But if, if the call that I feel scripture is pointing us to is to hold marriage in high honor among all, then obviously we're not holding marriage in high honor right now. Correct? We already agreed that we are not doing this as a culture, and we'll look at the fact that we're not doing it as a church either. And when I say church, I mean big church. Okay? Church in the United States. But here at the Federated, we need work as well. This is nothing really new. I know a lot of times we look at issues that we're confronted with and we're faced with, and we think, man, it's so much more difficult now because Satan's attacking our marriages. Since Genesis 2, when God performed the first marriage, marriage has been under attack. You look all through the Old Testament, attack after attack after attack. You look all through the New Testament, warning against sexual immorality, talking about people in the early churches that are having struggles and how Satan is attacking marriages. When you look past biblical times throughout history, you look at how marriage is under attack constantly. 
So this is not something new. But we also can look at our history of our nation and see where we have made some significant changes culturally to change the level of honor that we place on marriage. This is something that has changed over the last 50 years, 100 years. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. It's interesting, as I was preparing this week uh, to, to preach on marriage, I was looking up a number of different studies, and there was one study that I read from Yale University talking about what it was that led to the downfall of the Roman Empire. What were the 10 most contributing factors that led to the Roman Empire's fall? And the number two reason on that list of top 10 was moral decay and loss of family structure. Many of the people that participated in in this study felt that it should have been the absolute number one reason that the Roman Empire fell. And they cited multiple other empires that over time that were the most powerful or one of the most powerful, and what led to their fall was moral decay and the family structure breaking down. I bring this up because I want to remind us that this is God's truth from the Word. And God's truth does not apply only to God's people. God's truth applies to humanity. And so a study by Yale University, from a very secular point of view, done on a pagan empire of power, leads to the conclusion of God's truth of why marriage should be held at high honor and why the sanctity of marriage is so important. And so as we dive into this today, I want us to be reminded of what we are missing as a country and as a church when it comes to what God says should be held in high honor in the sanctity of marriage. Marriage in our culture today or our culture today is very different than what God intended. Cohabitation before marriage is the norm inside and outside of the church. Sex before marriage is the norm. Divorce is a very valid option if there's any struggles. Why work through it? It's a lot easier to just start over, move on. There are also common struggles of people looking outside of marriage for satisfaction, especially sexually. Marriage can be between anyone, according to our culture today, and sadly, according to our church. It doesn't have to be between a man and a woman. It can be man and a man, woman and a woman. doesn't matter. So if this is how we are viewing marriage as a culture, obviously statistics would say the church is different, correct? Sadly, if you've done any study, we're not that much different. We are some, but we're not that much different. So where are we as a church? And how did we get here? There's a study I would encourage you. I didn't print it out because I wanted to save money. It was like 17 pages. And it is a very fascinating study that I would encourage you. You can take a picture, go to the link, or just Google the religious marriage paradox, uh, younger marriage, less divorce. And it goes through a number of different things. The study takes 53,000 women and breaks down uh, a, a number of different variables that are in marriage, both inside religion and outside religion, okay? Uh, Then they break it down in categories of evangelical church, the Catholic church, the Muslim, you know, faith, and those that have no faith at all. And they go through a number of different variables to see the correlation between uh, getting married younger, uh, does cohabitation have anything to do with, with divorce rates, and they're looking from a secular worldview to see what these numbers say. The reason I'm using this is to point out that statistically, we are at a lower divorce rate in the church than outside the church, but it is very small. It is way higher than what it should be if we are looking to God's word for truth. 
we also do have less rate of cohabitation before marriage than those that are outside of the evangelical Christian church, but not by much. The statistic that stood out to me a lot was the one statistic in all of it that the evangelical church led. We had the highest percentage in this statistic, and that is we have the highest divorce rate of anyone, of any other faith base, of anyone that is non-faith. If we cohabitated before we got married, evangelical Christians lead the way in the divorce rate among that. It's like God is letting us know if you're starting off the most important human relationship in your life, if God has called you to marriage, okay, some of us have been called to godly singleness, but if you've been called to marriage, you've started it off defiantly against what I'm calling you to. And then those issues are never dealt with. And so I encourage us with that in mind, to realize when we look at Scripture what God is calling us to, to realize where we are as a church in this nation. So, what does the Bible say? What are the first principles when it comes to marriage? Again, we are not going to go over all of them, okay? We are going to go over some. There's going to be a lot of Scripture on the board that I will not get to, but I encourage you to look it up if you did not read through it this week. Some of it is outside of the reading plan, but we always should look to God's word, and so I encourage you to continue doing that. So as we look at how to hold marriage according or among high honor, I want to look at three stages that we do this. First of all, the first stage is that we hold high honor before we get married. Scripture calls us to hold marriage at high honor before we get married. We already talked about Hebrews 13, 4, where it says, Let marriage be held in high honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. This points to, in part, the call to avoid and to remain pure in your relationships before you get married. Not defile the marriage bed, talks in part to remain pure and to avoid premarital sex. In God's perfect design, sex is meant to be between a man and a woman in the sanctity of marriage. Cohabitation is directly against what God calls us to before we're married. We already talked about the statistics of this, so we don't need to rehash it. This is part of the aspect of sexual immorality that we see called out and spoken against so many times throughout the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 and 20, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Paul doesn't tell us to stand brave, to hold fast and to stand firm in the midst of sexual temptation. He says, run, flee. There are times we need to stand firm in things. That's the series. But how you stand firm and hold true to what God has called you to when it comes to sexual temptation is to look at Joseph's example in Genesis. When Potiphar's wife presented him or presented herself to Joseph, he put everything that was of earthly value to him aside, the position that he had achieved, all that had been built up, and he ran. On earthly paper, he paid for it greatly. But in God's eyes, we know the end of the story. And God blessed him tremendously through this. And so we must flee sexual immorality. We must flee that temptation. The other thing that I also want to remind all of us of is what Paul is not saying. Paul is not saying that there is no purpose or no value in sexual relationship. It is one of God's greatest creations between man and wife, between husband and wife. This is something that is celebrated This is something that is tremendous. It is so vital 
and helping man and wife become one in bonding. And so we must not get in a mindset as we are single or dating to uh, say, it's okay, do whatever you want, but also we shouldn't get in the mindset of it's bad, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. It is a beautiful thing within the right context, which is marriage. We also need to flee sexual immorality in the sense of we need to run away and we need to flee sexual gratification or thrills that one might find outside of actual sexual intercourse. Matthew 5.28 says, But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If you've ever studied the statistics on pornography usage in the United States and the world, it's staggering. Psychology Today did a recent study, and it says that 58% of individuals in the United States admit to using pornography on a regular basis. 33% say that they don't, and 9% say they would rather not say. And as I was talking to someone after first service who is walking through this struggle, and he and I have had conversation about it, he goes, you know what I heard when you read that? I heard 58% admit it, and 33% are lying. And I said, well, you know, maybe that's not it. <laughs> but this is a struggle that is plaguing both inside and outside of the church. Men's usage rate is still significantly higher than women's. But the alarming thing is in the last 20 years, the percentage of men that use it on a regular basis is about the same. The percentage of women in those 20 years has skyrocketed. It has increased a great, great deal. As a youth leader at Grace Church, when I was working there, let the staff know of the severity of the problem. They had a, a youth retreat talking about spec, uh, sexual purity, and her thing that she was alarmed of the most was the amount of females that were struggling with it and spoke to it once they separated male and female. And one female said, it's like being a cigarette smoker and walking around all the time with a pack of cigarettes and a lighter in your pocket and saying, don't smoke. Yet we continue to, as adults, carry these around, and we continue to let our children at whatever age have total access to all of it. And we wonder why there's a problem. The answer is not to throw every cell phone away, okay? It's not what I'm saying. But if that's your greatest downfall, and that's where you keep falling, it's like an alcoholic wondering why he keeps stumbling when he's still a bartender. You need to run. Might only be for a season, but you need to flee sexual immorality. We are called to something different as believers. I want to read 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8 to be reminded that we are called to something different, we are called to something greater, but also how and why we can achieve it. Verse 3 says, It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in a passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live holy or to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. The way that we can walk in a more God honoring way is the power of the Holy Spirit in us that does the work of sanctification. We all have struggles. Percentage-wise, a number of people in this room have this struggle. 
But we need to continue to submit to God and continue to submit to the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. The second way that we hold high honor among marriage is to hold high honor of who can be joined together. A common argument that I was reintroduced to that I had forgotten about, okay, as I was studying for this, is that, I don't know if you knew this, but the Bible never defines marriage. It just describes it. And as I was reading through uh, certain, you know, conversations and all this stuff, that kept coming back up between certain experts, okay, of Scripture saying that the Bible actually never defines marriage. It just describes it. And I want to say, whether you've heard this argument or not, just point out the fact that it's utter garbage. And it's a lie from Satan. When God talks about marriage in these Scriptures that we've read some of and that I'll read again in a moment, He is not just describing marriage. He is defining it. Yes, there are points of Scripture. There are many points of Scripture in the subject of marriage that is descriptive. It's describing what is going on. And it's not prescriptive, meaning that everyone should adhere to it. But I firmly believe Scripture defines marriage. Genesis 2.24, we already read, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and unites to his wife, and they become one flesh. Matthew 19, 4 through 6. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. And in 1 Corinthians 7, 2, it says, But because of the temptation of sexual immorality, Each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. God is clearly stating that marriage in a godly way is between one man, one woman. He's not merely describing marriage. He is prescribing what a godly marriage is. Yes, there are tons of marriages talked about in situations that are descriptive. Okay, Abraham pawning his wife off as his sister twice and letting her go off with two other rulers so he would protect himself. That is descriptive, okay? That's talking about a marriage. That's not saying how you should act in your marriage, okay? Or the infidelity in a number of marriages, King David, Solomon, whatever it is, that is descriptive, not prescriptive. But here, we definitely see that God is letting us know that is between one man and one woman. One other thing that we need to honor in a godly marriage of who should be married comes from 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Bilal? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Man, I wish I could emphasize this more, the importance of striving to make sure that you are equally yoked. To those who are single, and maybe you're dating someone, or those that are in a committed relationship, but not yet married, I urge you not to compromise in this especially teens. I know I've given all the excuses before too. Given all the reasons why I think it's justifiable for me to go out and to date a non-Christian. There's just no scripture that backs it up. I've also seen so many people be derailed because they didn't honor God in this way. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's popular among your friends at school. I'm not saying it's popular among your friends at work for adults. But it is what God has called us to. The most important decision you will ever make in your life is what you do with Jesus, the risen Savior. What you do with the empty tomb pales in comparison 
every other decision you will ever have to make. But man, let me reiterate how important it is. If God has called you to marriage, the importance of seeking someone of faith. At this moment, I do want to say there is so much precedent for godly singleness. I would love to be able to speak to that. We don't have time. Okay? I would also remind you that is part of why I chose some of the scripture reading for this week. Because there are those that God has called you to godly singleness in this season of your life. And maybe he's called you to godly singleness for your entire life. Paul speaks very highly of that. I want to encourage you to listen to the podcast this week as that's what our discussion is on. Um, and we have an extensive discussion of what that looks like to walk through life in godly singleness. So we've talked about how we hold marriage in high honor before we get married. We talked about holding marriage in high honor in keeping with what Scripture says of who gets married. And now I want to talk about as we wrap up how we honor marriage after we get married. You're going to see a couple of topics and Scripture come up on the screen. Do not worry, we're not going through all of that. Okay, I would love for you to either take a picture or write down these scriptures and these different topics. I'm going to touch base a little bit on it, and then I'm going to go back to the covenant relationship and what that means. We already talked about marriage bed undefiled. We talked about that, of what God calls us to before we get married, and those truths ring true to after you get married as well. God has called us to keep our marriage bed undefiled in those ways once we are married. The next one is divorce. We've talked about this in the past here. We're not going to go into divorce. The one thing that I do want to say, though, especially off of talking about not being unequally yoked, is what we read in 1 Corinthians 7, where Paul reminds us that if you are married, if you are living with another person and are married to them and your spouse is not a believer and you are, that is not grounds for divorce. You are to live your faith out. You are to continue to follow Christ, continue to allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify you in hopes that your witness will be the greatest witness. Now, what you should try to avoid is like, well, so I know I shouldn't get married to this non-Christian, but once I get married, then I'll, I'll land on Paul's truth there. Okay? That doesn't excuse to being unequally yoked. But I want to remind you to look to those scriptures before divorce. So a covenant relationship. Marriage is a covenant relationship, and this is something that we have totally lost in our culture. Okay, I would really encourage you, if you ever get a chance to look at some of Timothy Keller's uh, teachings on this in the meaning of marriage, or he's done some other sermons uh, that were tremendous uh, during his time here on earth when he was alive. But one of the things that a covenant relationship talks about is the fact that marriage is not transactional in basis when it's done in a godly way. We are both called to serve our spouse. We are both called to make sure that we are serving them and putting them before us instead of selfishly saying, it's about me, it's about me, it's about me. It's not transactional. When you look at our instructions in Scripture, it isn't, uh, you know, like transactional. Well, if my wife, you know, if Angie does this, you know, if she makes sure she washes the dishes or whatever, I'm just throwing something out there, then I'll cut the grass. But until then, I'm not doing my part of the bargain. Or, you know, Angie and I get in a disagreement. I will apologize for my part, but she's apologizing first. That's, that's not what we're called to. We're called to a covenant relationship. One that mirrors the covenant relationship of Jesus to the church. Malachi 2, 14 through 16 says, You ask, why is it, or why? It is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, 
though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. The man who hates his wife and divorces his wife says to the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord God of Israel. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. Malachi is reminding the nation of Israel that their marriage is a covenant. Ephesians 5, 32 and 33 says, This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each of you must love your wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Marriage is a covenant relationship. It is one that is a covenant between you and your spouse, and way more important, it is between you and God. You have made that covenant not just between you and your wife or you and your husband, but between you and God. This is of great importance. But if you're human and you've ever been married or are married, you know we fail at keeping that, right? Again, if you're human, there has been a time that you have broken that covenant in one way or the other, whether it's just not honoring your spouse, not serving them, whatever it might look like. For some, this might be a current struggle that you have. You just can't walk through your marriage in an honoring way. If you're struggling with this, can I encourage you with a question? Are you and your spouse opening the word together? I know it might be difficult. I know it feel, might feel really tricky, especially if you're at each other's neck. Have you been praying together? I would encourage you to take those steps. And it might be in a point of contention that like, yeah, good luck with that one. And if that's the case, call one of us as pastors whether you want to come in and meet with one of us or you want us to suggest a, a sound biblical counsel that will help you through this, we can do that. The worst thing is, is to sit and think it's going to fix itself. You must seek godly counsel to help you through this. So I encourage you, if you have lost sight of holding your marriage, in high honor. Reach out to one of us. Start to get in God's word together. Start to pray together. Marriage was God's idea. From the beginning of time, it was the first relationship between humans that he established. He's the one that protected it. He's the one that called to lifelong fidelity when he gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. He's the one that chose a wedding feast to be his first public miracle. He's the one that continues to wait to come retrieve his bride, the church, in all of his glory when he returns. This is why he calls us in Scripture to hold marriage in high honor as a representation of of his marriage, and a mirror of his marriage to the church. We must hold it in high honor before we get married. We must hold it in high honor of who we get married to. And we must hold it in high honor after we get married. Would you please stand with me? As we close, we already talked about the fact that the church is becoming more and more of a mirror image of what the world is doing when it comes to marriage. Too often in the church in America today, we are continuing to try to take Scripture and we are trying to bend it around our culture to make it fit as best it can. That never works out well. We are called to something different. We are called to let the Word of God change us. We are called 
to allow the Holy Spirit to do the work to sanctify us, to be more like Christ. You want to know one of the reasons people don't want to come to the church in America? We all know the statistics. Not really that different. So why not just stay where they're at? We are called to be set apart. We are called to be different, to glorify God, to honor God, but more than anything, to point people to God. Because he is the only answer in this world. He is our only hope. There is only hope through him. So may we be reminded as we leave today, how should we respond? We should respond by continuing to not conform to the ways of the world. Romans 12, 2, do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Lord, that's our prayer today. Lord, I pray that our minds would continue to be transformed to be in line with you more and more. God, as we walk through these biblical truths, and I mentioned earlier, anyone in the room has probably struggled at one time in their life with something that was talked about, or maybe are still walking through that struggle today, whether it's sexual immorality, holding their marriage in high honor, dating someone outside of their faith. But Lord, we also know that if we repent and come to you, that you offer forgiveness. You offer a better way. And you give us your Holy Spirit to have the strength and power to move forward in those those difficult truths that we need to stand firm to. Lord, I pray that as we go from here today, that we would hold marriage in high honor, but more importantly, we would hold the word of God and the truth in the word of God in high honor and follow it. We love you, Lord, in your name. Amen.